it was an, the number of people was gigantic. It was, yeah, yeah. There was a whole floor of people. Then there was another floor where people did ancillary work. The whole company was really revolved around these because this is where they made their money. Yes, absolutely. We processed yes. 100,000 of these every day, and they sold for an average of 31 cents a piece, mm -hmm. and they wore out. In fact, Otmar once wrote to the company and said, I can make them so they don't wear out, and they said, nah, never mind. <laughs> You know, the punch presses shook the building. Didn't they? I mean, oh, yeah, I was just I mean, going to say. Yeah. Um, when they were casting, you, could, you knew they were casting. Uh, yeah. they, they were punching out stuff. So we have all of these drawings, by the way, in the type vault in the back. Uh, they went to the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian didn't want them. And so we wound up with them. And they are, this is the history of type. Now, no designer of type ever did these. You gave drawings to the letter drawing office, and then they produced these drawings. And the notes on these, some of them are really interesting. There'll be little notes that says, per Mr. Griffith, yes. um, uh, or poor Mr. Jackson Burke. Um, and there were other notes on it. When they converted to photo typesetting, there were yes. red unit, notes on it. Of yes. This is actually 1943, and it was designed by uh, Dorothy Abergard. I don't remember. I don't know her either. Um, <laughs> But, the but each of these, the, these drawings were all kept in a uh, folio box. And at the bottom was a sort of cheat sheet that told you a uh, sort of uh, breakdown of the essential dimensions and any little bits of history, what Mr. Griffith said to do, and uh, so on. You know. So they give you a little capsule history of how this, this face came into being. At night. We found phenomenal notes in them. By the way, it all started around 1917. Chauncey Griffith was a salesman for Linotype in Kentucky. And he wrote to the company and said, our type is terrible. And so they brought him to Brooklyn and said, you're in charge. And he wiped out everything they did before, and he started from scratch. And he created a world-class typographic library. In fact, if you look at the typefaces we use on a regular basis, they go back to most of the Linotype typefaces of the 20th century. Um, he was succeeded by Jackson Burke and he was succeeded by Mike Parker. Yeah. Uh, Mike eventually got the title Director yes. of Typographic yeah. Development, and he had the best office at Linotype. Yes. Mm -hmm. He had these wonderful built-in bookcases, mm -hmm. and he had all the archives of the company. He had Otmar's uh, notebooks, um, and he had these big white sheets of paper on his desk. I was delivering the mail to him one day, and I had read a memo about Clarendon. And I said, Mr. Parker, what's a Clarendon? And he clears his desk, and he draws the history of the serif for me. <laughs> he was that kind of a man. By the way, there's a picture over there of Matt and Mike. Uh, so so in, we're, we're in the, the hot metal era, but yeah. now you're starting to see that they're getting into photo typesetting. Indeed. It was really, I, I think it was, you know, at, at the moment I arrived, um, the letter drawing department had really sort of broken the back of the work of converting the metal library to film. They hadn't finished it, but most of it was done. And so a lot of the things that Mike and I talked about before I got there, and obviously after, were kind of concentrated on were the styles of type that had never been made for slug machine use, for technical reasons. You couldn't curl, you couldn't so on. You had to duplex the mats. But you could do it for photo composition. So so that was really, I think, what, um, what, what really got me hired, as it were, that, that there was an opportunity to, to, to take advantage, technical advantage, of photo composition in, in certain respects. Now, Matthew mentioned duplexing. This is one of the limitations of the linotype machine, because every matrix had two typefaces on it. One was the regular, one was the bold or the italic which meant that the bold or italic had to be modified to match the width of the regular font. When we went to photo typesetting, we no longer had that limitation. Yes. So much of the work that I just mentioned that the letter drawing office did of adapting the metal library to film was taking the italics off the same widths as the Roman and putting them on their own natural widths, which, um, which obviously greatly improved the photo typesetting italics. So when they moved to photo typesetting, they had to produce the first fonts for film. And that was the linofilm machine. 
And this is a grid from the linofilm machine. And, and by the way, these were pricey. Um, and you, you put them in a little unit that revolved and then picked them up and then put them into the, the line for photography and then had a way of selecting the character and exposing that through a lens to size it and then exposing photo material, film or paper. Um, to make these, there was an entire room which Matt mentioned at, in the basement. And <laughs> it was on hydraulic lifts um, with a granite block, I think. One end was um, these plaques. By the way, we don't have a plaque. I should find one at yes. some point in time. Um, and each one was a different letter. And they actually, it was high. It was like eight feet high by eight feet wide. And they would put all these plaques in there. And there was one for every letter. And at the other end, end of the room was a camera <laughs> where they had film in it. And they would then, no, no, it was a glass. glass that had silver halide coating. And they would expose it. And that's how they created these grids, which made them extremely expensive. They had to have this room because Bryson Street was very close to the Brooklyn Creeds Expressway. So the vibrations uh, were phenomenal. <laughs> this room was called the Floating Cloud, and it, the whole room was on springs. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, and Bruce, who, Bruce, what was Bruce? Do let me handle this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were four of these on a kind of windmill, and they were each brought into the, into the path of the, uh, of the light with a bicycle chain, weren't they? Do you remember That's that? correct. <laughs> yes. so, these machines, I mean, they were full of thermionic valves and clattering relays and so on, but there was also a mechanical part of them that was very strange. Yes. By the yeah. way, uh, well, they were later sued for patent infringement and paid a million dollars to Photon mm -hmm. over some of the patents involved yeah. in all of this. Um, now, other companies that were getting into photo typesetting created artwork in different ways. And I've got a whole collection here of some of the different ways they created artwork for photo typesetting. Uh, and again, they would photograph these in various kinds of cameras. Uh, some of this comes from Intertype, some comes from a CompuGraphic. They were all different in, in that regard. Um, but all more or less the same scale that I was working at. I mean, this is a very handy scale to work. Big enough so you can get the edge quality right. But it's not too big that you can't see what you're doing. You know, the problem with those 10-inch drawings is it's really hard to visualize what this is going to look like at eight point, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so they got through the, 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 the line of film. Then they created a cheaper machine called the line of film Quick, which was really bombed. It didn't do very well at all. Yes. Uh, but the machine that made Linotype was the VIP. The VIP Variable Input Photo Typesetter and we have one in the back, by the way. And this was the font for it. And by the way, this was the text one. There's a, another version of this that was bigger for doing display type. And this is where Linotype really excelled. This is where they made their money, if you will. However, there was another guy who made as much money, and his name was Leonard Storch, and he also made these. And Linotype sued him, and they lost. <laughs> so he, uh, he made a fortune making... Uh, fake fonts, if you will, but they were cheaper than linotypes. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, this was a phenomenal marketplace, and uh, this is how I got into publishing. I published a newsletter for VIP users called Vippy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and by the way, linotype didn't like it because I could tell things about the machine that no one else would tell you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so they sued me for $13 million. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard about that. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, it never went to trial because when we did the discovery phase, they discovered the terrible mistake they made in suing me. And so they settled by, by giving me a lot of money, $80,000, to go away. <laughs> <laughs> so I built an addition on my building, and I called it the Mergenthaler Wing. <laughs> so, in any case, the VIP to me is a very special machine in many ways. It, it, it really... It had very significant consequences of a technical kind. You know, designers are not supposed to like engineers. Um, you know, there's supposed to be one of those different sides of the brain problems. But I really, I've always liked engineers enormously and liked working with them. And one of the best experiences had to do with the VIP. And without getting technical about this, the line of film, the original line of film, the big line of film, as we call it, big blue line of film, um, you could not have a zero width character. I could explain why, but I won't. <laughs> On the VIP, you could. 
And I've never been 100% sure whether the engineers really understood the significance of that typographically. The reason was that the, the writing prism in the VIP was driven by something called a stepping motor, which was fallout from the space program. Mm -hmm. You could send pulses of electricity to it, and it moved, you know, jerked along. But you could also not send a pulse, so it stayed still. Suddenly, you could do Greek with accents, you could do Devanagari, you could do a whole range of non-Latin scripts, as we called them at that time, um, that were really not possible by previous means. So I had a very nice period of going to Athens a number of times because our very energetic agent in Greece realized that this machine was perfect, you know, and he could sell a lot of them, but there were no Greek types. So I did Helvetica Greek, I did Baskerville Greek, Century School Book Greek, <laughs> <laughs> Herman drew uh, Optima Greek at 36 point, you know, he drew everything at 36 point, I made the production drawings. So this took several nice trips to Athens to do this. Um, it was successful, you know. They sold a lot of machine. So that was, you know, that that sort of interaction between the technology and the design is something that's always kind of fascinated me. And, and I have, you know, had several experiences of of that, um, of, of working with the engineers or uh, telling the engineers things that we wanted them to consider that would be very advantageous to us typographers and so on. So that, you know, that's always been a kind of contrary to what and designers are supposed to And when they went to the 54 unit system, that allowed you to do much finer spacing. <coughs> exactly, the, the big line of film was 18 units and the IP was 54, yeah. And that made a big difference. It did. Now, you also worked on the 505, I assume. Yes. That was a machine invented by Purdy and Macintosh in England. Um, it was a cathode ray tube. Uh, the characters were scanned from a grid and then exposed through a cathode ray tube. It's sort of an intermediate approach. But it had a problem in a number of fonts, and Mike came up with this idea for slanting the, um, the Roman to create the italic. I, I don't know whether it's Mike. Yeah, by the way, just because we're recording history here, when I was working at Crossfields, I visited Purdy Macintosh, and I saw the very early stages of this machine. Um, and I told Mike about it, and he went and looked at it, and next thing you knew, they bought the whole company. So I was never given any credit for that. <laughs> but I, I claim that. And the reason they did that was they had it developed a machine with CBS Labs called the Linotron 1010. Later yes. on, they named it that. And they sold uh, several. They sold um, one to the, two to the government printing office, two to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. One was supposed to go to Ford Motor Company, but they turned it down. And that was it. There were no other machines. It was too expensive. It was too big. Um, later on, the government printing office got rid of it. Um, I was in charge of the publicity for the machine. We got mm -hmm. on a show that Walter Conkright mentioned the machine. It was great publicity, yeah. but they realized that it could never be a commercial success, so that's why they needed another machine, and that was the 505. So 1010, 505, yes. the numbers tell you nothing about the machine. Again, it, it was a hybrid machine. The, you know, the, the reading end of it was digital, was CRT cube, but the input end was scanning a thing very much like a, a, a Pinefilm grid. <coughs> And so the laydown speed was phenomenal, but changing fonts was again, you know, some sort of windmill thing, you know, <laughs> that brought another font up into the well, well, the next machine that made them was the Linotron 202, yeah. which Derek Kite created in, in England, yes. and uh, that became a phenomenal success. And that was a pure digital machine. Yeah. Your fonts came on floppy disks. Let me interrupt you because I haven't finished oh, I'm sorry. Saying, uh, about 505. Because the font change was so slow, people started making electronic versions of the uh, distortions. It's like, you know, if you get your TV set set up wrong, the raster goes to hell. 
you can do that under control. So if you do a sheer distortion of the raster, you get an italic. It's not an italic, it's a slanted Roman. But people started to do that just to save the time that it would take from going from Helvetica Roman to Helvetica Italic with a, with a font change. Or by going wide, you know, stretch the raster and out it goes or you condense it and so on. So enough of this was going on that Mike came to me and he said, you know, Helvetica was not designed for this. Futura was not designed for this. Supposing we designed a sans serif where the geometry was specially configured to do some damage control. In other words, you know, we're never going to make it look right. It's never going to be a true italic. But maybe it won't be quite as ugly as <laughs> slanting italic. So we did this, and we, we made a special typeface, a sans serif. We call it video, which was really damage control, uh, typographic damage control. And uh, it did mitigate some of these horrors that came from fooling around with, with the raster. But of course, and this is another parable, no sooner had we done that than they came out with the next machine which had an electronic font change, no loss of time, video died a death, um, not for the first time in my life, designers were asked to solve a problem, an engineering problem, but engineers are smarter than designers in the end, and they, they fix the problems, the engineering problems. And designers are left with a, with a solution to a non-existent technical problem. <laughs> but, you know, you could say that it's worth doing things like that because these machines go through shakedown cruises. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you and Mike leave about the time of the 202 or right after that? We left in... Um, was it 80 or 81? One or the other. Yeah, yeah, the president of Linotype was a guy named Smith, who was a complete idiot. Yes, um, came over from the British company. Yeah. Well, he was an American that somehow ran the British company. Oh, yeah, that's no right. one that's figured right. that out at all. And then after he left Linotype, he started a company up here in New England, which he put out of business very quickly. Oh, really? So, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, yeah well, well, that's how we wound up with uh, yeah. all the font libraries from Photon and all those. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. In any case, you and Mike now are uh, free. Had you decided to do Bitstream before or after? Before. Here's what happened. You know, during the 70s, thanks to the VIP, which, by the way, could set much bigger sizes. I mean, Line, line of Type had been a text company, you know, text type company. You could only go to 36 point on a, on a line of film. But the VIP went up to 72, at least, something like that, yes. On some models, but not very many. Oh, um, okay. Anyway, it, it opened up the prospect of display typography for Linotype, really seriously for the first time. So we, that's to say the Merventhal folk, in combination with the British company and the German company, ran this very <coughs> energetic fruitful type development project uh, during the 70s, which was predicated on the very, very successful sales of the VIP. You know, there was this big population of machines out there, so we could sell a lot of type to the, to the owners of the machines. But during the 70s, towards the end of the 70s, Alinotype's market share started to decline quite noticeably. And uh, Mike and all of us became concerned that we probably wouldn't be able to continue to run as vigorous a development policy program as we had done for several years. So we thought, well, how about we make type its own PL? Make it, you know, rather, I mean, Line type's business traditionally 90% equipment, 10% type. Type was a machine part, essentially. Supposing we didn't treat it as that. Supposing we made it its own profit center. Um, but the line type management didn't, didn't go for that. And then the other thing that happened that had a very big influence on us was the invention of 
very high-end, whole-page digital composing systems, Cytex and Camex principally, there were, there were others. Cytex was an Israeli company originally in the fabric business, weaving business. But they were very smart and they developed these revolutionary machines that went into Time and Newsweek and places like that. I mean, they cost millions. And they, they, they emphasized color, which was the key. Yes, and, and the whole page. I mean, you didn't just set a galley or a line of type. You, you set the whole goddamn page with illustrations and diagrams, everything. So, but they had no type. They had this amazing technology, uh, breakthrough technology, but no type. So they came to, I don't know, they probably went to monotype and everyone, trying to license a library of type. But they were turned down again by the line type management who said, no, our type is for our machines and so on and so on. And Mike and I and, and others really thought this was a big mistake because we thought, again, if we made type its own p &L, we could license the type to these companies and we would make a lot of money because we thought they had a very bright future. You know, the Mac computer wasn't yet <laughs> no, didn't exist on, yet. On, in existence, <laughs> which put an end to that. But um, So we really wanted to do a bitstream from within Linotype. We wanted to have a type department in Linotype that did its own thing and made good money. But we were stonewalled completely by the management, and we felt so convinced about the need for this that we decided to do it regretfully, I must say, on the outside. And Cytex and Camex, who we'd be, been talking to, and, and you know, were, Mike and I were very sorry that they would turn down, um, they kind of gave us a grub stake to get started. And a, a number of designers joined us and so on. And so we, we started a company in Cambridge. We, we weren't technicians. We started in the shadow of MIT because we knew we'd want good programmers, good technical people, and so on. We found them. Um, so, the, the, so we did what we wanted to do within Linotype, <coughs> outside of Linotype, uh, as, as it turned out. But if you're ever looking for the entire digital um, Bitstream Library. I once traded them advertising in Type World magazine for the entire library. I have it upstairs. It's on floppy disks. <laughs> I don't know how you read them, but that's a different <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have it too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, and Bitstream was, was a success. You did very well with Bitstream. Um, for, for a while, yes. For a while, yes. I mean, uh, I, I, I was there for 10 years. Um, I only designed one typeface in the course of that that time. I mean, my time was well spent. Uh, I, I was in endless meetings and so on. Um, but um, the we, Bitstream's strength was the OEM business, was, was licensing time to these big companies, Canon, Sharp, so on, you know. Um, but a decision was made to go into retail, in other words, to go head-to-head -head with Adobe in the retail market, font retail market. And I, I, I thought this was a perfectly fine idea, you know. But I realized that there was no one at Bitstream who knew anything about the retail business, you know. We were all OEM people and very good at it. Mike was an OEM people, the head of engineering was an OEM. So the board decided to go into the retail business. And Mike had meanwhile uh, resigned and left. So they hired a, a president from the OEM business. And we thought, this is crazy. 